Hi. Good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to the Climate Center. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, to another engaging event during Energy Week. I'm Angela Pachon, the Research Director of the Climate Center. And we are here today to discuss a topic that may not be the flashes, but is undoubtedly critical. The decarbonization of the industrial sector. So as many of you know, energy intensive industries such as cement manufacturing or chemical production, steel making, are not only major contributors to global carbon emissions, but they are also very, very hard to decarbonize. In fact, nearly 30% of US greenhouse gas emissions come from these industries. So the Biden administration has taken significant steps to support decarbonization efforts uh, through funding from the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law over 6 billion has been allocated to advanced transformative technologies essential to decarbonizing the US industrial sector. These investments uh, are have been allocated in addition to multiple tax incentives for clean technologies to the industrial sector. So which is great news because not in the past in, in the history of the US, there have been climate policy targeted to the uh, industrial sector or in general as climate policy in the US was non-existent. But however, as they say, the devil is in the details. And while all these investments hold immense potential, there is a risk that it may not deliver the expected impact. Worse, there's concern that it could uh, subsidize fossil fuel production instead of driving the transition to cleaner alternatives. So these are big challenges. And uh, uh, to talk about this, this and all the nitty gritty details of the implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act, we are thrilled to have here Danny Collinworth. Danny is, is, is a senior fellow of the Climate Center. And as a climate economist and lawyer, he has fo focused on the design and implementation on scientifically grounded climate policy. And obviously understand very well these nitty gritty details of implementation that I think are the, the what we are going to see in the next two years, it's gonna be key. So Danny, he has, his academic research has been published in top journals in various disciplines. He has been involved in dozens of legal, uh, legal and public policy processes with the state, federal, international, and pri private sector regulators. And uh, he has been uh, uh, invited to provide expert testimony at nine legislative hearings in California. He's also a research fellow with the Institute for Carbon Removal Law and Policy at the American University and the vice chair of California Independent Emissions Market Advisory Committee. He holds a JD and a PhD in environmental, Environment and Resources from Stanford University. And without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Danny. Thank you, Angela, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, I've been affiliated with the Climate Center for the last academic year, and it's just been a real privilege to get to know folks in this community and to be able to visit Penn. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I wanna talk today about some actually really big picture and important issues. So I'm, I'm really glad you're here to join me. And it has to do basically with the fundamental transformation in how the US has approached energy and climate policy, which is now happening largely through a philosophy of policy tools that's called industrial policy. This has been out of vogue for a long time. Many countries, including the US, have had industrial policies of one kind or another in the defense sector, in various manufacturing sectors. But the Biden administration and their key landmark policies in clean energy and climate policy are the first time that's been really explicitly brought to bear 
uh, on the clean energy and climate conversation in the US. Um, and so I wanna talk about some of the things that are maybe going well, as well as some of the challenges that, uh, that happen to follow with this particular approach to doing climate policy work and its implications for some of the major emitting sectors here. So at a very high level, when you're thinking about public policy and regulation, there's kind of two families of approaches. You've got carrots and you've got sticks. Um, there's different philosophies and reasons why a regulator might prefer one approach or another. Um, it turns out, uh, I'm, I'm sort of an amateur political scientist because I hang out with political scientists and I watch policy processes. One of the things that my political scientist colleagues have really taught me is how much more popular carrots are than sticks. This is like kind of obvious if you think about it. When you deal with industries that are major polluters, they tend to like the idea of being paid to do something slightly different rather than, than being told to do something different and pay for it themselves. It's kind of obvious from a certain point of view, but it's, it's worth dwelling on because the primary support structures we see right now from the Biden administration have come almost exclusively in the form of carrots rather than sticks, in part because it's been politically easier to mobilize resources and attention in that direction. It can work, it can be done very well, but there's a series of challenges and consequences that follow from that. Now, in a lot of the literature in climate policy sequencing, people talk about starting with carrots and then moving to sticks over time. So for example, you might start with some subsidies to do clean energy activities or to convert dirtier forms of technology into cleaner alternatives. And then slowly as acceptance and the feasibility of those approaches builds, it becomes easier to regulate uh, those sources directly because you've proven various ways of doing things and you've established the cost of doing them. Um, in the US, that's I think particularly challenging these days because even though uh, I would argue we have foundational environmental laws that provide our federal regulatory institutions with the legal authority, clarity, and direction to regulate climate pollution, there's a certain institution in the US government that is highly unlikely to agree with that, and that's the US Supreme Court, um, which, to be perfectly honest, is in the middle of gutting the administrative state, which further weakens the possibility of using regulations based on existing statutory authority to go after pollution reductions in the United States. So we're in a particularly notable moment in terms of the philosophy of how the federal government is approaching um, the emissions reduction problem. It's proven politically acceptable uh, and functional to develop various subsidy policies in the form of carrots. It's been very difficult and legally increasingly risky, even though I think a sound legal analysis of what regulators authorities would be at places like the US Environmental Protection Agency, I think they've got lots of good arguments about what they wanna do, but every federal agency right now, when they think about taking action on pretty much any issue, knows they're gonna be sued immediately, and they're concerned about their prospects in a federal court system that is increasingly hostile to the regulatory enterprise. And as an example of this, the US Securities and Exchange Commission, one of the major financial regulators, has been working on a climate disclosure rule that would require publicly traded companies to disclose both their emissions and to talk about the climate-related financial risks they face as they look into the future uh, and their business model. Um, and the climate rule came out uh, just a, a week or two ago um, substantially less ambitious than many people hoped for, I think in no small part because the SEC was expecting litigation from opponents. It was an 800 page rule within 24 hours of the rule being finalized and I still have not read the whole thing. There was a lawsuit from 10 states filed in court to, to oppose the rule. Gives you some sense of the landscape a regulator is facing uh, in this circumstance. And so for a variety of reasons, not just the political feasibility of organizing around subsidy policies, but increasingly the political and legal opposition to regulation that is undermining the, the broader federal regulatory enterprise, sticks really aren't on the table in very obvious ways. Now there's two flavors of sticks I wanna mention, um, just to provide a little bit more context. You could imagine regulatory programs where a government regulator says pollution standards for power plants have to be at a certain level, like what the EPA uh, has done in the past and is proposed to do in the future. You could also imagine uh, economists' favorite tool for addressing climate pollution, which is pricing carbon. Um, and that's another form of stick that, that has been talked about in many places, is pursued in places like my home state of California. It's also pursued pretty aggressively in the European Union. There are a number of different arguments people make in favor of carbon pricing, and I want to touch on this very briefly because the U.S. basically didn't go in that direction. Um, there are questions about whether it might in the future, but at least in the short term, we know it's not. One of the standard arguments you hear about carbon pricing is that it's increasingly popular. Um, something like a quarter of world emissions are subject to some form of carbon price, uh, one kind or another. 
And this is a figure from the World Bank uh, uh, Standard Report they put out that's one of the go-to sources for information. And you can basically see that, you know, 20 years ago, basically nobody was doing this. Uh, the European Union was the first major economy to start pricing carbon, and so you see a jump in the percentage, about 5% of world emissions covered when the EU starts its policies. A number of policies come online over the coming decades, and that last big jump is China deciding to apply a, a carbon price to its power sector. Um, I wrote a book with my a longtime collaborator and friend, David Victor, a couple of years ago, making the arguments for why carbon pricing is unlikely to be a major part of the climate transition. And I just wanna simplify that very briefly for your understanding because um, many people who like carbon pricing would say that carbon pricing will solve a number of the problems I'm gonna to introduce to you today. And I agree that one of the most important consequences of not pursuing carbon pricing is that these problems now emerge. And so I wanna talk about those and I wanna acknowledge that, that gap. It follows in no small part from the fact that most countries are not pursuing carbon pricing and those that are, are using it as a complement to their stronger regulatory policies and carrot subsidy-based uh, approaches to industrial policy. Um, and very briefly, the big problem with carbon pricing is that it makes very visible the costs uh, of the policy, which tends to raise energy prices. It concentrates opposition it, by treating all sectors subject to the same price, which is what economists would tell you is a good way to get an efficient outcome. You kind of upset everybody uh, and you concentrate your opponents all in one place. There's a variety of reasons which the book walks through in extensive detail why even though the logic of carbon pricing is sound from an economic theory perspective, the very things that make it functional from an economic perspective also make it particularly challenging from a political perspective. And around the world, we see this pattern repeated and repeated and repeated. Um, and this is actually an opportunity to call out uh, a friend of mine, Jesse Jenkins, who's now a professor at Princeton. When he was a visitor here at the Kleinman Center, he wrote a fantastic paper that makes the point that is covered here in this figure, which I know is too small to read, um, but this figure from the World Bank. Jesse made the very insightful point back in 2019. When you look at that World Bank figure showing almost now a quarter of world emissions covered by a carbon price, that sounds impressive. A quarter of the world is doing this? Um, maybe we should get on board, maybe this is happening. When you look below the surface layer and you look at the carbon prices that are applied in most of these jurisdictions, they tend to be very, very small. So the vast majority of programs that have a carbon price have a very modest price that is far below the levels that people calculators are equivalent to the damages when you put carbon pollution in the atmosphere. And they're far below the levels needed to encourage technology shifting, even in the easier to decarbonize sectors like electricity. So for the most part, these carbon prices are present and are helpful, but are far below a level that's needed to get major change done. Uh, and to Jesse's credit, he was one of the first people to call out, when we talk about the prevalence of these policies, we're actually overstating their impact and their importance in the places where they do exist. And this is a, a pretty consistent fallacy you see repeated all the time, including today, where people love to show figures of how many programs there are and how many countries are doing this. Most of them are doing just a little, which is good and much better than nothing but it basically isn't the main show anywhere. The only major economies that are using carbon pricing at a level that is making a substantial difference to their economy-wide decarbonization agenda are in Europe and the United Kingdom. Um, a small number of European countries have carbon taxes that are quite substantial in addition to the European carbon market price, which applies to the electricity and industrial sectors. Outside of Europe, very few other countries are following this model. Canada had been set to potentially pursue it, but there's quite a bit of electoral backlash against the Canadian carbon pricing policies today. And so pretty much everywhere around the world, the transition is being led by non-carbon pricing policies. Even though carbon pricing helps, it's good when you have it, it's just never the center of attention when you, when you get right down to it. So if carbon pricing isn't the main story, and in the US it is definitely not the main story, what is? And what happens when you pursue these industrial policy instruments? So I'm gonna call out four different categories of policies, and I'll talk about two of them in a little bit more detail. The first policy you see heavily represented, particularly in the Inflation Reduction Act, are uncapped tax credits. What is an uncapped tax credit? It's a, it's a window of eligibility, where if projects meet the definition of what the Treasury Department sets for that tax credit, they can get as many tax credits as they like. They're uncapped. There's no limit on the total number of any kind. Uh, my friend Tim Sahay, who was involved in the negotiations of the Inflation Reduction Act, likes to call these bottomless mimosas. The idea is you can have as much as you want. There's no limit. Um, and that's potentially very good or very bad, depending on your view of what the tax credit does and what it actually ends up supporting. 
The second category of industrial policy is what I'll call discretionary federal funding. And there's lots of different kinds. I'll just call out a few items and, and we'll talk about a few of them potentially in discussion uh, after the main talk. One of the most interesting things we're seeing right now is there's a couple of large funding sources for green banks coming from federal money where the bank, basically the concept of the bank is there's some federal money available and the banking institution would leverage it to collect more private capital and use this infusion of public capital to be able to lend to substantially more uh, than would be the case if you were just trying to pay directly with federal money. Perhaps the most transformative and biggest piece of this whole puzzle is the US Department of Energy's loan program office, which is basically co-financing projects where they use the government's cost of capital, which is substantially lower than the cost of private capital today. And they lend that cost of capital through various financing agreements to private sector players. It's a very direct involvement of the state um, where the state's activities are substantially changing the financial and economic picture of projects that are selected to participate. And this is a classic form of industrial policy where there's a direct partnership between the state and the private sector to co-execute and co-fund things together. You see a variety of other discretionary federal funding types. There are um, direct federal funding of under the bipartisan infrastructure law, a series of so-called regional hubs for hydrogen production as well as for direct air capture, where the federal government has basically said there's a bunch of money on the table. Um, regional initiatives should propose to us how they want to build these activities, and we'll fund a big chunk of them if they do that. There's also some really interesting federal procurement. When you think about things like the US Postal Service buying electric cars to replace the older generation of delivery vehicles in the Postal Service, or uh, faculty member Jen Wilcox, who is running the, the Office of Carbon Management uh, fossil energy and carbon management at the Department of Energy, which has some money to procure carbon removal services directly, where the government is buying things and trying to bring into market uh, various new technologies. There's a suite of other uh, kinds of policy instruments, block grants, where various agencies have money to push out the door in partnership with state or local governments, as well as regulatory structures. I'm going to speak less about them today because these are traditional tools of policy that are relatively well understood. The first two categories, I think, are really new and present some, some interesting challenges as they're manifesting um, under the Biden administration and, and the future of the American uh, Climate Policy Project. So let me dive into the uncapped tax credit world, this world of bottomless mimosas. Um, and the sort of short story to give you right off the top is that some of the statutory provisions for tax credits are totally inflexible. They say something very specific and they leave little discretion to federal policymakers about how to implement those tax credits. The example I'll talk through on this is the tax credit for carbon capture and storage under 45Q, section 45Q of the tax code. There are uh, other statutory provisions that are significantly more flexible that involve discretionary decisions that the Biden administration and their potential successors will have to make in order to implement these tax credits. And therefore, the choices the administration makes will have profound uh, differences in outcome. Um, and we need to understand both of them, because if you are a federal regulator, you can potentially change or modify your decisions when the statutory regime is flexible. If the statutory regime is inflexible, it will probably take legislative action to change the direction of the tax credit. As you can see, there will be different levers of change if you're concerned uh, about the results that might follow. So let me walk through an example uh, on the carbon capture and storage side of the picture uh, based on a really interesting and frankly kind of disturbing paper from my friend Emily Grubert uh, at Notre Dame uh, and Francis Sawyer, a consultant in the Bay Area. And they wrote a study looking at the evolution of power sector emissions in the US under the presence of this tax credit, this, this carbon capture and storage tax credit. Now there's something you need to know about this tax credit, which is a potentially beneficial approach that pays for people to put CO2 underground. Now, I would much rather capture CO2 and put it underground than vent it to the atmosphere. I got no objection to that. There are a number of applications where carbon capture and storage technologies might be a really sound and perhaps one of the only available mitigation tools that's out there. So that can be a really sound application. One of the challenges with this tax credit is that it is not designed around choosing what a so-called good project is. It is a tax credit that is written based on the mass of CO2 you stick underground. So wherever you got the CO2, however you got it, whatever processes you're using, whether you're building new fossil fuel sources and capturing the CO2, whether you're retrofitting existing facilities and helping to transition them uh, to a lower carbon future, the tax credit works exactly the same. And the tax credit doesn't provide substantial discretionary authority to policymakers to change that implementation. And uh, Emily and Francis, uh, my colleagues who wrote this paper, 
um, wanted to explore the potential implications of what that means. Um, and it's frankly kind of a disturbing story, and I want to walk you through it. We don't know what is going to happen here. I just want to outline some of the different scenarios to give you a sense of how uncertainty in these tax credit implementation pathways has potentially major changes uh, and major implications for the, the, the country's energy and climate future. Because this tax credit does not really have any strings attached, it pays out whenever you put CO2 underground, it can potentially be used in ways that delay or distract from climate progress. Um, again, it could be used very, very well, but uh, it's potentially used in this way. Uh, and although um, renewable energy on its own today is not the final answer to all things, we need to have a balanced grid that's reliable. There's lots of things you need to do to fully decarbonize the power sector. Um, it is also the case that you know, even today, in many places, renewable energy is cheaper than fossil fuels. And so if you were just trying to optimize the electricity system based on private costs, many utilities ought to prefer renewable energy over fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage. That is not necessarily how the incentives in the utility industry work in the United States. Many vertically integrated utilities in areas that still use coal-fired power are vertically integrated. They make money based on capital expenditures. They don't have to optimize costs to benefit their ratepayers the maximum amount. They get money when their regulator approves their expenditure packages. And so Emily and Francis ran numbers that basically show it is conceivable for many utilities, even though it might be cheaper for them to pursue renewable energy, it is conceivable and privately profitable to them and their shareholders, but they would nevertheless install carbon capture and storage equipment that would not otherwise be economic. It's not the cheapest option, but it's something that could make profits for them. And Emily and Francis looked at three sets of scenarios, which I'll highlight here for you one step at a time, that describe what happens if the carbon capture and storage is used to extend coal plant lifetimes and keep them operating for longer than they would otherwise operate in a competitive market environment. And the worst case outcomes are shown here in the highlighted yellow uh, area of the slide, where it shows that even though we currently project based on that black line is the, the business as usual line, um, which is kind of a remarkable thing, by the way, when I was in graduate school, people thought coal was gonna keep going forever. The fossil fuel fire generators are currently projected to decline over time in this country because of the favorable economics of clean energy and alternative technologies. That itself is a great victory, um, but it is not assured, particularly in the presence of various potentially distortionary incentives, such as this tax credit. And so Emily and Francis looked at what would happen if these coal plants had their lives extended by 20 years, if they used this carbon credit and basically kept on operating. Because this tax credit, like many of the other tax credits, only has, in this case, a 12-year eligibility window, it means that after the tax credit eligibility window expires, there's no incentive to keep operating your carbon capture and storage equipment. This is important because running carbon capture and storage equipment is very energy intensive and it's very expensive. So if you don't have to do it, if you're not getting paid to do it, if you're not being forced to do it, you might prefer to turn that capture technology off if that's a feasible option for you. And so one of the concerns they outlined is if a bunch of people were to install these, these carbon captured storage facilities on fossil fuel fired power stations, and they wanted to keep operating them after the extension of the, the uh, after the tax credit expires, it's conceivable that you could end up with facilities basically being extended in their lifetimes, leading to substantially higher emissions. And this is kind of a worst case story they paint where power sector emissions actually don't end up falling all of that much after the tax credit window expires way out into the 2030s and 40s. A related scenario, set of scenarios looks what happens if the coal, life plant were, coal lifetimes were extended by about 12 years, which is a more of a moderate set of assumptions that reflect the older age of the coal technologies. And just to highlight how there's a range of possibilities that include these really concerning outcomes, as well as some potentially very good outcomes uh, Emily and Francis looked at scenarios where there's no extension of the plant lifetime, where this is basically used to sort of ride out the existing fossil fuel lifetime. It may not actually be the cheapest way to reduce emissions, but if you actually did that and you didn't extend the lifetime of the plant, you could still be consistent with this downward trajectory. You don't quite get to the most aggressive reduction scenarios, the kinds that have been called for by this administration and others, the kinds that are needed for truly deep decarbonization. But even broad deployment of this technology family in the power sector, as long as it doesn't lead to longer lifetimes for these plants, is potentially consistent with deep decarbonization. The whole problem here is the tax credit itself doesn't tell us which of these three worlds we're going to live in. And while you might say, for example, maybe the US Environmental Protection Agency will, will put regulatory standards on fossil fuel fired power plants, 
they're going to run straight into the jaws of the Supreme Court if and when they try and do that. I hope they will do that. They have every right to do that as far as I'm concerned. But practically speaking, there's significant risks that the, the Supreme Court will defang EPA's ability to work on climate policy. All right, let me give you a second example. I'll talk about the hydrogen tax credit, a, a very generous production tax credit for producing hydrogen. Hydrogen is really interesting because it's one of the energy carriers that you could imagine being involved in a wide variety of activities in a decarbonized economy. Um, hydrogen is used today in the chemicals industry and the refining industry. Uh, it could be used in the future in the power sector or to help decarbonize high temperature heat industrial applications that we currently don't know how to electrify. If you think hydrogen is going to work, you can make it cleanly at scale and relatively cheaply. It can potentially do lots of different things as an energy carrier if it's made again quite cleanly. And one of the advantages hydrogen has over electricity is that gas can be stored for a very long time. Again, as long as you have safe equipment and manage leaks and, and all of that. Um, electricity systems, we have to balance more or less in real time. We have good storage for hourly storage with lithium ion batteries and a few other technologies. We currently do not have long duration storage that's capable of storing for days or weeks or months, which is the kind of duration we're likely to need to fully decarbonize the power grid to ride through extreme weather events um, that involve relatively little sunlight or relatively stiff uh, uh, um, low wind speeds. These already happen. We know we have to plan for them. And so there are substantial challenges in decarbonizing the power sector on renewables alone. If you don't have some answer to the long duration energy storage or the dispatchable clean energy storage, uh, clean energy generation problems. Hydrogen is potentially an answer to those kinds of problems because you can store the gas and use it whenever you need. So if you can do it cheaply and cleanly, it provides potentially a lot of benefits. Today, almost all hydrogen is made directly from fossil fuels where fossil methane, CH4, the hydrogen is basically stripped off of the methane, which leaves carbon, which is oxidized into CO2. Um, because it's produced from fossil methane, it has substantial methane leakage associated with the production of oil and gas, as well as the transmission of gas in pipelines for distribution. And again, when, when you strip the, the hydrogen off of it, um, the steam methane reformer, you produce CO2 uh, at the point source there. Um, there's a variety of different ways you could clean up hydrogen production. And there is a tax credit called 45V uh, that provides extremely generous tax credit levels for the production of hydrogen. Unlike the tax credit for carbon capture and storage, the hydrogen tax credit has strict emissions performance criteria. So the statute says you must emit less than certain thresholds in order to earn the tax credit. And what's really interesting about the structure of this tax credit is that there's four different thresholds. Um, the lowest tax tier starts at 60 cents per kilogram of hydrogen. It goes up to a dollar and it jumps from $1 to $3. So $3 is five times higher than the lowest tier. It's three times as high as the next tier. There's basically a very, very big payoff if you can qualify for that top tier of the tax credit, if you can get your emissions below that specific threshold. So the big policy question for implementation is what do you have to do to show that you've met that emissions threshold? What do you actually have to do uh, to demonstrate that? And the statute suggests, although it does not necessarily require, that the US Treasury Department use a model called GREET. Um, and I always forget what it stands for. It's known by its acronym GREET. It was developed a long time ago. It is basically a spreadsheet calculator that looks at different pathways for producing initially transportation fuels. And it's now been adapted into different variations, including this standard research model. The Treasury Department has created a specific model just for a tax credit for sustainable aviation fuels. It's created a specific bespoke model just for the hydrogen production tax credit. The California state government, which runs a clean transportation fuels program has its own bespoke version of the model and an international offsetting program has its own bespoke version of the model. This model is being used essentially as a bookkeeping device to make various claims about the life cycle emissions of various fuel production pathways. And the policy structure that's being proposed here is that the model will tell us the truth of the life cycle emissions of these fuels. Now, there's a couple of different ways you can make hydrogen at a high level. The two different ways I'm gonna talk about are hydrogen produced from electrolysis. It's called green hydrogen. That's where you take water, H2O, and you use electricity running through an electrolyzer to split the water into hydrogen and oxygen. 
And if you can do this with low carbon power without any indirect effects of consequence on the grid, you can produce very, very low carbon, almost carbon-free hydrogen. So this is one of the, the goals. If you wanna decarbonize industry or the power sector with hydrogen, this is one of the ways potentially to make it clean. The other major pathway is to continue to use methane as a feedstock, which primarily almost exclusively comes from fossil fuels today, could maybe come from some biogenic sources tomorrow, but there's a variety of ways you could do that and maybe put on carbon capture and storage technologies to help reduce some of those emissions. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the options that the treasury department has put forward in proposed rules and some of the consequences that might follow from the different options they might select. So the draft hydrogen rules uh, largely adopted what's called the three pillars model. This is a model that was developed by a coalition of nonprofit advocates and green hydrogen uh, industry participants who say they wanna meet particularly high standards. And it's designed around this problem of indirect emissions, which I'll, I'll share you, uh, with you in just a minute what that looks like. And the three basic components of this rule, the three pillars, are what's called incrementality. So if you were to, for example, have this green electrolyzer, this very load heavy new addition to the grid, and you powered it with renewable energy, you might say, well, that's clean. Renewable energy has no emissions and therefore I have no emissions associated with my facility. The problem is, is if you pull clean energy off the grid to serve your new load, what turns on to replace the green energy? Almost everywhere in the country, the answer is fossil fuel fired power generation. So just because you claim clean energy doesn't mean you actually get a clean energy outcome on the grid. You can easily cause a corresponding increase in fossil generation. And one of the ways you might wanna handle that is by requiring that, that the new load be matched by new clean energy resources. This is not a perfect requirement to get you to what economists and, and climate policy researchers call additionality. It's actually kind of a weak proxy, but it's a standard that's in place to make sure that we're not just pulling existing resources off the grid, letting the grid backfill it with fossil energy and pretending the outcome is clean. By including some kind of a newness requirement or what's called incrementality, we reduce the possibility of this sort of indirect emissions consequence. The second part of three pillars is what's called deliverability. The clean energy resources that the hydrogen producer wants to say, these are my clean energy resources, they need to be in the same area of the grid. And this sounds kind of obvious to I think a lot of people, but when you look into the world of environmental attributes and trading of carbon certificates and renewable energy certificates, you often see completely ridiculous claims where a facility in one part of the country will buy a carbon credit or a renewable energy credit all the way on the other side of the world or sometimes on the other side of the country. And that's clearly not really how the physics of the grid operate. Um, and so the concept with deliverability is we're trying to bring it closer to approximate the physical impact of the grid. So your clean energy better be new, it better be near you and not too near, but it has to be near enough. And one of the most important parts of this picture is that it has to have hourly matching. So when your electrolyzer is on, the hour it's on, you should have a renewable energy attribute certificate that is also from the exact same hour from a new resource that's relatively nearby. If you don't match it in an hour by hour basis, it's very easy, for example, to turn your electrolyzer on when the grid is stressed out and it's running on peaker power plants that are the most emissions intensive plants. And those emissions intensive plants have to go a little bit harder. And you buy a renewable energy certificate from a place like Texas, which has abundant wind resources that they don't really need all the time in the night. The idea that you would say, add new load in the middle of the peak afternoon on the grid is the same thing as taking credit for renewable energy in the middle of the night. It's clearly not how the grid works. It's not how physics work, um, but it's actually pretty commonly allowed in many other policy regimes. The treasury department has proposed a much more robust outcome here. And let me uh, explain with an example uh, why this matters. This is a paper from a grad student uh, called Wilson Ricks at Princeton, who's a, a phenomenal analyst. Uh, who works in Jesse Jenkins' lab in Princeton, and they published a paper that was one of the first academic exercises to walk through the consequential analysis of when you add new, new electrolyzer load to the grid, what happens? And on the far left side of the picture in the sort of lighter yellow or brown shading, um, that's the attributional emissions, what the facility claims if it doesn't have any requirements, if it just uses grid power. And it ends up producing emissions that don't qualify for the tax credit. They're slightly better than, um, than uh, the emissions of conventional fossil-based hydrogen, which is shown in the horizontal red line. But if you actually estimate what happens to the grid with the backfilling of new, new generators turning on to meet that new load, you get that higher, darker, browner bar, which is substantially worse than the emissions from conventional fossil-fired um, hydrogen production. 
If you go to the right side of the figure, you see some of those, uh, those again, similarly patterned bars. That's where you don't have hourly matching, where you match the renewable energy attribute certificates on a weekly or an annual basis. A similar story emerges where you can claim lower attributed emissions, but you end up not being able to produce emissions that are any better than conventional fossil production. And the two series in the middle where you see the little brown bars dip below and go a little bit negative are where uh, there's requirements that resemble the three pillars that are hourly matched. And when you apply those strict conditions, you can produce hydrogen that not only has the direct impacts that qualify for the tax credit, but also don't harm the grid and end up in an indirect picture having an overall positive experience in terms of emissions. So the Treasury Department was eventually convinced to start here as the proposal, but there's enormous backlash from industry, some of which I would argue is potentially good faith. One of the challenges we have is basically nobody makes hydrogen today from clean resources and clean production pathways. And so some proponents of uh, uh, electrolyzers and green hydrogen will say, we ought to be willing to accept higher emissions in the short term to get the industry off the ground. Um, there's some potential merit to that argument. I'll point out the statute does technically not allow that. It says the hydrogen has to be low emissions, including its indirect emissions. But there are some people who would prefer a different trade-off. There are others who I think are just interested in building as much as they can. And the prospect of unlimited tax credits is really exciting to investors and to project developers who would like to put new projects on the ground. Um, and it's leading to some extraordinary and I think unexpected tensions. Um, so here's a letter that was signed by the governors of California, Oregon, and Washington, which they sent into the Treasury Department on their comments. And they said, can you please give a special compliance pathway for states that have agreed to set a target for 100% clean energy in their electricity sector? So the idea here is if a state or a jurisdiction is committed to 100% clean electricity, maybe the governors say, you should let us have a special compliance pathway to get into these top tier of the tax credits to qualify for these projects. And one of the reasons the governors are so interested in this is they're part of a regional collaborative, a couple of different regional hydrogen hubs that want to get built in California and the Pacific Northwest, um, and they want to be able to earn the tax credit, which they conceivably not, might not be able to do if the tax credit is set in a way that doesn't increase emissions. So you have the governors of some of the most progressive and pro-climate states basically saying, lower the standard for us. Uh, and just to drive this point home, all of the major regulators in the state of California, where I'm based, signed a letter that contained this just obvious falsehood, a really remarkable thing for serious senior policymakers to say. They say, any new load added to the electric grid in the state of California will be served only with new renewable and zero carbon resources that are added to the electric grid. This is not an accurate or a correct description of how the grid works in California today. California has a legally binding target to have 100% clean electricity by 2045 and 60% renewables by 2030. It does not require that all new load be met with clean electricity resources. And in fact, as you add new load in a stress grid that is actually heavily relying on natural gas, natural gas use is gonna go up. So this, I hope, gives you some sense of the politics that are involved here. The interest in deploying hydrogen hubs and getting those hubs to qualify for the tax credit is leading states and politicians who many people associate with strong climate policies to ask the federal government to lower their standards. The story gets, uh, frankly, a little more controversial and interesting when you think about producing hydrogen from, from methane gas. Um, this GREET model I mentioned, the model that, that's gonna be used as bookkeeping here, um, uh, assumes that methane emissions from leaking from the, the oil and gas system are only 0.9%. Most of the high quality studies that have been published estimate that methane leakage is closer to two, two and a half, sometimes 3%. So the numbers are severely underestimating the methane consequences of using natural gas. But even with those relatively generous assumptions, it is almost impossible for a fossil fuel fired production process to qualify for even the lowest tier of the tax credit, unless, and this is something my colleague Emily Gruber and I realized a couple of months ago, unless they're allowed to offset their methane emissions, which is a practice that is currently used in California and which several people are proposing to do at the federal level. Let me explain the consequences and then I'll tell you what it means in practice. So if you have a, a steam methane reformer, a conventional methane production process for hydrogen, and you don't have any carbon capture equipment installed at all, you cannot qualify for the tax credit full stop. But if you are allowed to say that 25% of the methane you are using to produce hydrogen comes from a so-called negative emissions feedstock that's captured from a dairy digester 
or from a landfill perhaps, you are able to qualify not just for the lowest tax tier, but the highest tax tier. If you put a 90% carbon capture and storage facility on your production process, you only needed 4% blend to get there. Even though that 90% carbon capture and storage would on its own produce emissions that do not qualify for the lowest tier of the tax credit. A small amount of blending of methane offsets allows traditional fossil fuel fired pathways to outcompete and dominate the clean electricity based production in hydrogen. And this is a process that is already allowed in California, for example, to give you a sense of what this looks like, there are hydrogen production facilities serving refineries in the San Francisco Bay Area and the South Coast in Los Angeles. They are allowed to, for accounting purposes, say the methane they are taking from the fossil gas distribution network is in fact methane that was captured at a dairy in upstate New York, even though there is no pipeline that connects natural gas systems from New York that flows from New York to California. For accounting purposes, they are allowed to make this claim and the state of California is heavily subsidizing fossil fuel fired hydrogen production processes in its own policies. They're also asking the federal government to maintain that practice and that approach. And if that is allowed, it would only take a little bit of blending for fossil hydrogen production systems to outcompete um, their green counterparts. Last thing I wanna say before closing um, is uh, just this, this beautiful piece from my colleague, Fran Moore, who's a professor at the University of California, Davis, and who served on the Council of Economic Advisors in the White House. She has a wonderful piece on the hydrogen uh, puzzle as an example of the challenges of climate policy government governing uh, in the US. And she has this extraordinary quote. She's a, a very thoughtful economist who's, um, who's got a lot of practical experience. And she says, the design of major climate policy cannot rest on project level life cycle emissions accounting that omits partial and general equilibrium responses you either need economy-wide carbon pricing or re regulation to address this problem. If you overly subsidize and you don't have a sense of what's going to happen based on your subsidy, you can end up with really distortionary outcomes that in theory could be managed through carbon pricing or through regulation, neither of which for the reasons I began with at the start of my talk, look at all remotely feasible in the United States in the near term. Uh, and I think it's a really important insight that we really need to be very careful about how we manage these subsidies because a huge amount of money, tens and possibly hundreds of billions of dollars is gonna flow through these highly technocratic decisions that have extraordinary consequences that are not being actively managed. Last thing I'll say, um, some of this information is already being tracked right now. We're gonna need, basically somebody needs to be in charge of managing this system. No one really is. Each of these individual tax credit decisions is being made more or less in isolation. There are thoughtful people in the administration working on this and thinking about the connections, but it is currently nobody's job to steer the ship when you think about it at a high level. There are some outside efforts, uh, and this is an effort, uh, it's a partnership between the private consultancy, the Rhodium Group, uh, and Brian Deese, at, who's now in residence at MIT, uh, who used to be the director of the National Economic Council, and they're tracking clean energy investment, which is flowing from many of the tax credits uh, under the Biden administration's policies. So there's lots of interest in tracking the investments that are being made, but for some of these really complicated questions like hydrogen and carbon capture and storage, it's not enough to track where are the projects and what are the dollars. You need to track the system impacts and think about how the design of the tax credit is either leading you to where you wanna go or distorting you from where you wanna go. And the very last thing I'll say is that when I think about the challenge of managing this process, um, I think not only about the possibility of regime change, which is a, a kind of a scary thing for some of us to think about. Um, there was an initiative called the Social Cost of Carbon that emerged during the Obama administration, an effort to calculate the damage that's being done when you put CO2 into the atmosphere. And when the Trump administration came to power and basically pulled all the authorities to do this, there was a philanthropically funded effort to basically incubate all of the policymaking and analytical research processes at a think tank called Resources for the Future, whose work led to uh, a series of publications that were quickly adopted for use in the Biden administration. And I'll say irrespective of whatever happens in the, the November elections, I think it's gonna be have, important to have more and more research connections between think tanks, academic research groups, and the policy environment, because right now we're in a world where it's just carrots and no sticks. It is very difficult to anticipate what the design consequences of these policies is going to be. Um, and we're gonna need to have a lot more mobilization and attention on the systemic consequences with so much money moving out the door for a series of bottomless mimosas. So I will stop there uh, and hopefully uh, looking forward to discussion. <laughs>
Well, thank you. That was a very insightful presentation. And as I mentioned, it was the nitty gritty details of all these subsidies. I mean, we, we all, on a daily basis, we hear all this good news of money being allocated to these new technologies, new green technologies, but obviously the, the devil is in the details. So a, 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 a thought about, I mean, what it's carrots and stick and the lack of sticks in, in terms of uh, green energy policies in the US. And uh, I wonder about the role of the states. The state we have seen in California, they have been able to implement perhaps more um, uh, green policies than any other states. So what is the, can, can states uh, have a role in this void that of, of uh, sticks? Sure, and, and states can and do play a really important role. I spend a lot of time in my work, frankly, on state policy because it's an area where impact matters and, and you, can, you can get things done. Um, but uh, so I, I want to agree, first of all, that yes, states can do things and states that look at these funding opportunities and want to make proactive choices to channel resources in productive ways can be very influential. On the other hand, not every state is going to want to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think at best, it's a very partial solution. Um, and as I mentioned, with the case of these hydrogen hubs, you have many states that are that have you know strong track records in clean energy and climate policy. They're more interested as a political matter in increasing the flow of money from the federal government to them than developing those sticks. And so I, I think it's very hard to put this job on the states, although I hope some states will step up and say there's things we can do to put the guardrails on here that would otherwise be absent. Well, and and um... I'm, I'm thinking as well the hydrogen hubs, but but um, you mentioned this specific example of the 45Q, which is the subsidy for carbon capture and storage. And this is not a new subsidy from the IRA. It's been for a long time. And uh, I wonder why, I mean, there was not a, with the IRA an opportunity to really redesign this subsidy, given the flows that I mean, they're not new. They have already been there since the beginning. And this, I think, speaks to a much bigger and, and maybe darker challenge. So you're right, This the carbon capture and storage tax credit has been around for several years. And again, it, it could be used well. So I'm, I'm not saying it's bad or the technologies are all bad. Quite the opposite. It can be used well. But the primary recipients of that funding right now are oil and gas companies who have largely been producing CO2 to inject, they're not even capturing all that much, they're actually harvesting some of it from natural geological deposits. And, and I think it's fair to say that the interests of the oil and gas industry left to its own devices are not necessarily gonna produce that outcome. The challenge I see with all of these subsidy instruments is somebody who thinks this is like, this is the right general way to get started. Um, and it's been the politically feasible way to make progress in most countries. Once you start a subsidy regime, whoever gets the initial sort of subsidy mechanism becomes the most heavily vested stakeholder in that process. And they like to keep it basically the way it is. So I would love to see, for example, reforms to the 45Q CCS tax credit that say, we need to say what a good project is. We need to exclude projects that create CO2 pollution to capture it for technology subsidies. We need to put various safeguards on there. But the primary recipients of that subsidy today are presumably very strongly opposed to that. And that's the challenge we have when you think about using subsidies to get started. There are genuine reasons to say, set the standards in a relatively lax place to let the industry get going. The problem is if the wrong industry gets going, they all become attached to maintaining that outcome and it's hard to restrict the subsidies in the future. Yeah, and, and so giving this limitations, uh, with the hydrogen subsidy, where right now it's it's on a common phase, so there are possibilities of changes. So how, how do you see those, I mean, these decisions going? Because I mean, these are very uh, big lobbies and, and hydrogen has been, hydrogen and carbon capture for the oil and gas industries has been a way to demonstrate that they are on board with the energy transition. And I suppose they they are fighting for, I mean, being heavily subsidized. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I I, I think I'm I'm confident the administration is aware of all of these issues. Like people are very thoughtful. They're aware of the arguments on all sides. Yeah, I, I just to be 
honest, like the, the reaction from powerful constituents to the rule saying we need to water the, the proposed rule down scares me a little. Uh, the consequences of moving backwards from the proposal, I think are significant. Um, and I don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, put yourself in the shoes of the administration. If you have, you know, powerful allies saying weaken your rule, that's hard to maintain in the face of broad industrial opposition as well. Um, and, and I think it's all the more reason that we need more really serious analytical work in the academic and the nonprofit sector to track what's going on when whatever happens, happens. Because there's going to be a lot of disagreement over what the right choice is, no matter what happens. And we need to be able to track and empirically tell what is going on. Are we on the right track? Are we off the right track? The, the battle lines are very clear. Um, and, and I don't think we know exactly what they're going to do. Um, it also mentioned, I, th I think this is one of the big one of the first really big tests for policy implementation uh, on climate policy in this administration. Many of the other policy programs have been met with broader support across the environmental constituency. And this is the first really big high dollar question where they have to make a decision and they're gonna upset a lot of people, whatever that decision is. Yeah, and, and the, you may think, I mean, what happened next? Because if there, this rule is contested, what's next? The, the subsidies are not getting allocated, which is, I mean, that won't benefit anyone. So yeah, and I mean, it cuts in a lot of directions. So if it goes into litigation, and it gets held up, you know, that could be an issue. The other thing that's a little bit scary is the proposed structure of the rule is a rulemaking that would point to this modeling framework, you could change the model tomorrow, a new administration could come in and just sort of wipe the model out and put whatever numbers they want in. So it's very easy from an administrative law perspective to tweak this however you want, and that cuts in both directions. So you could imagine the administration saying, okay, we all heard that we used the wrong methane leakage numbers were you know, two to three times lower than the best estimate should be. And we're gonna substantially revise that next year, which is gonna make gas look relatively less competitive. You could also imagine a different administration coming in and saying, put whatever numbers you want in there and let all the money flow out the door. And neither of those would, would technically require notice and comment processes. They could be done very quickly. Uh, and I think this is just an example of, this is a very different form of policy making where the eligibility for the tax credit is based on some pretty wonky stuff that's pretty easy to move in any direction you like. Yeah, okay. And let's talk about green hydrogen because I think one of the promising uh, parts of, of the IRA was trying, seeing that uh, this is a technology that may come finally and get subsidized. But I mean, the way this this rule is 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 so far, I mean, discuss, and um, and the way the other issue, I mean, how they interact with electricity markets to prevent uh, uh, fossil fuel generators to come back. So what it seems that for green green hydrogen, it's is it's been very challenging. It's going to be very challenging. And therefore, I, I wonder if, I mean, this interaction with electricity markets, are there ways where green hydrogen can get rewarded in a way that, I mean, because it provides storage and therefore could be more uh, uh, beneficial for these projects that are going to start right now to, to in, in the process of being decided. So is there any talks about what, what can be done in terms of electricity markets or, or other sort of subsidies that can be allocated to this industry? I haven't heard a lot of talk about other subsidies, but, but just to be clear, I mean, the, the question is what kinds of green projects are gonna qualify and some at least are gonna qualify and they're gonna get this potentially very generous subsidy when they do qualify. Um, so I'm worried less about will money flow to the projects that qualify. I think the debates are around who should qualify. Should it be a lot of different kinds of people who might risk these emissions consequences on the grid? There's just to be clear, there's like a number of problems with this. So if a new hydrogen project adds a bunch of new load to the grid and pulls clean resources off the grid to power it, there's going to be significant cost implications for ratepayers as well. This is not just an environmental question. Um, and the other issue that, that I, I wish the green uh, electrolyzer industry was paying more attention to is if there's extremely favorable treatment to gas production processes, especially with these methane offsets, who's going to want to pay for more expensive green electricity-based hydrogen if a conventional process is being overly subsidized with the same levels that were designed for a brand new innovative technology that's fundamentally more difficult thermodynamically to pull off 
than stripping hydrogen atoms off of a methane molecule. Yeah, this this morning at Wharton, there was this event on electrifying everything, and there was an investor on, on green hydrogen, which was directly talking about this point, that it's in terms of cost, it will be very difficult for, for them to compete. And therefore, it's, um, I mean, it's a question of, of how many benefits the 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 blue hydrogen could get compared to the green hydrogen. Um, well, I think that's a good discussion about hydrogen. I wanted also, because we're talking about in industry. Uh, what about the small and medium industries? Because uh, I mean, there's the 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 obviously these policies may affect them. There are subsidies also for this small and medium, but uh, how? I mean, what are the challenges? Which I think may be completely different of of the big industries that may switch directly to one different cleaner source. Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of challenges. One of the things that um, you know, if we're able to make low emissions affordable hydrogen production, and I should mention we haven't talked about infrastructure. It's actually hard to put hydrogen into existing gas pipelines. There's a lot of infrastructure challenges around that. But if we can do that well, that creates a situation where smaller firms can just buy the hydrogen and use hydrogen in place of other fuels that they're currently using. So one of the advantages of doing hydrogen right is it allows smaller players not to have to worry about all this complex emissions accounting and these weird models that I've barely scratched the surface on and probably bored half the people here to death about. It really matters. And it's, it's actually great if we can come up with a system where we produce hydrogen that you can call clean and then you can use in any application without having to go through the same analytical process. Okay, so let's, let's open the floor for questions from the audience, anyone? Well, it seems like it, it, you're shy. <laughs> um, first, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. Um, I uh, attended a talk uh, uh, presented by a professor class about a month ago and I asked a similar question. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what I'm going to ask now, but um, you mentioned vertically integrated utilities causing issues with this policy implementation and that their use of it is prolonging uh, fossil fuel generation via the, the application of carbon capture um, and not incentivizing them to decarbonize fully. Um, another issue that I've run into in the uh, my professional field with vertically integrated utilities is uh, a hesitant nature to accept renewable energy interconnection because they own the assets, they own distribution. And these are huge multi-state Exelon, XL Energy, PSENG, et cetera. Now I'm aware of certain um, for, like policy bodies like NYSERDA up in New York, where there's a political appetite for renewable energy uh, growth, whereas in lots of states there doesn't, that doesn't exist. So all that to say, my question is, is there any federal policy uh, stick slash carrot uh, wielding that you can use to incentivize utilities to stop standing in the way of renewable energy interconnection as they so common do and, uh, you know, clear up that aspect of their uh, hesitancy to decarbonize the grid? It's a, it's a really good question. And, and part of the challenge I'm trying to outline here is the main policy tools the federal government has, has been empowered with are like tax credits and money. And you've very appropriately raised, and I'll just commend this to everybody, pretty much anything you work on in clean energy or climate is gonna flow through the barriers of how the utility system is regulated. It is different in every country, and there's like 20 different modes of failure in the US, but it is without a doubt one of the most important barriers to pretty much everything all of the time. And it's not just vertically integrated utilities. Pretty much every utility model has challenges associated with it. So I really appreciate the question. Um, I think this, this gets to this fundamental problem of when you get serious about what the barriers are to change, it's not just numbers in a spreadsheet about how do you get to a financing outcome that's appropriate, which is a problem tax credits are really good at solving. Um, you have these fundamental barriers. Uh, I think you know, this is an area where you know, you'd be looking for FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, to try and figure out some issues. Um, it sounds like this was Alex Class you were talking to, he was one of the, the great sort of experts in thinking about how transmission policy works. 
I'd also recommend, uh, there's a guy called Ari Pesco at Harvard Law School, who's like a living encyclopedia of electricity policy issues. These are some of the smartest people who are thinking about what the like hyper nitty gritty details of utility regulation are. There are no silver bullets, but increasingly I agree with you, it's the interconnection barriers. It's the opposition of the utility business models to investments that are sound and make sense, but may not be the most privately profitable option for that utility. And those perverse incentives and industrial organization problems are about the most important thing people can be working on. It's gonna take state action, it's gonna take federal action, and there's like no simple answer to that question other than to say, that is the problem. That is the huge problem. And just to be clear, when I showed you the sort of horror stories from Emily Grubert's work with Francis Sawyer, we don't know exactly what the utilities are gonna do. Um, I found her paper very persuasive that this is a possible outcome. And with all of this stuff, you have no idea what the utilities are gonna do. You can find and make cases for why they might wanna do things that are the wrong things. And we can point to lots of examples where they're opposing you know, good ideas that are broadly shared by all. So again, without a doubt, utility incentives and utility regulatory structures are at the heart of a lot of all of this. More questions? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm curious about steel. Have you written anything or researched anything about decarbonizing steel? Or could you say anything about how that's going in the US? We have several projects in Europe that are trying to decarbonize steel now, but what's the picture in, in the US? Are there any policies and how is it going? I haven't spent a ton of time on steel in the US. Um, my understanding of the, the European example is that a lot of what you're seeing is, is a really interesting sort of consortium based activity where people are basically trying to m match buyers and sellers. So making green steel, there's a couple of different approaches to doing it. It's gonna be much more expensive than conventional steel. So the only way a producer would wanna do that, particularly for these capital intensive commitments is if they're pretty clear somebody's gonna step up and buy it. So a lot of what I understand the leadership in, in European green steel movements has been around has been matching buyers and suppliers to figure out who's willing and able to pay the higher price to create the conditions under which the European manufacturer might do that. Um, I know less about how that's happened in the US. I think a big part of the challenge here is the federal government is not necessarily particularly well equipped to do that with the tools it currently has. Um, and there've been a lot of trade talks between the US, Europe and others around some of these issues. The idea that you could form a sort of a club and some free trade rules around this has been an area people have explored, but those talks have continued to deadlock. So I don't have any magic answers other than to say, when it comes to brand new capital intensive production processes, price incentives are really hard to get the job done because you need an off taker, unless you're so massively subsidizing that the cost of that process will be dirt cheap compared to conventional approaches, which is arguably the case with hydrogen. Um, for other cases, you really need to very clearly match the buyer and supplier. Um, and for some of these hard cases where, uh, just maybe just to back up for a second here, when you think about like renewable energy, which is now like the cheap option everywhere, not all sectors are gonna have that success story. Many sectors are gonna end up with the clean option being more expensive than the dirty option as a persistent condition. And that's a very different policy problem to try and solve where matchmaking the buyers and the producers is all the more important. Um, that's as much as I got for you because I don't want to get out over my skis over what's happening in the U.S. other than to say it's a, it's a big deal. And it's an example of a capital intensive sector that's going to be slower to move than we might want. Yes. Hi, thank you for your talk today. Um, this is a little bit cart before the horse, um, but I work in transportation planning, so I'm really interested in moving towards more affordable hydro cell buses for public transportation. I'm wondering if there are any examples of policies that are um, less on the production, hydrogen production side and more on the like readily available ap application side, more towards just like more, more affordable um, hydrogen cell buses right now in Philadelphia and um, across the region. We are planning um, through 2050 and we're kind of in the middle. Maybe we'll have, when it's time for a fleet renewal for our large um, transit agencies, maybe we'll be able to afford hydrogen buses, but it's probably not going to be hydrogen buses. So I'm wondering um, 
what should I keep my eye out on for when it comes to um, the readily, like the actual application of all of this hydrogen production, whether it's clean, whether whether it's whether it's not. Um, that's a good question. I, I confess, I'm not an expert in the medium heavy duty vehicle sector, so I, I don't want to uh, speak out of turn. And I think when it, when it comes to hydrogen, you got to know that you've got a supply, right? Um, and you know, I think this is one of the reasons that um, battery-based bus systems have, have been doing a little bit better. Um, I live in a city, I live in San Francisco, where we actually have overhead power lines, which means you don't even need to have onboard storage, which is like, the actual cheapest option if you've got that infrastructure. Um, one of the criticisms I'll make is friendly criticism of the Inflation Reduction Act is that a lot of the subsidies in the transportation sector are for personal vehicles. And we really didn't focus nearly as much on you know, public transit buses, school buses, the heavier infrastructure, which is, as you suggested, currently paid for by cash strapped local governments that rarely have the money available to pay for a slightly more expensive option. So I hope there will be a lot more focus on that in, in future efforts. Um, and I, I, I'll, I'll defer, I have a colleague, Costa Samaras at Carnegie Mellon University who likes to say, this is exactly what you should think about for the Inflation Reduction Act version two. And I mean that in a serious way because this was a policy package that came together. If anybody followed the twist and turns of all of the various predecessor bills that eventually became the Inflation Reduction Act, it was a circus. Um, and, and we got the biggest climate investment package in history out of that process. Um, there are some gaps, and I think it's really important to start to tell the story of how those gaps trickle down to the, the, the individuals and the local governments who wanna do the right thing, but don't necessarily have all the tools to do it. I would much rather see major subsidies for electric buses than for electric cars myself, and we might get both in the future if that's something people care more about. Thank you. Or hydrogen, I should say. I didn't. I was trying to be agnostic there. Um, yeah, thank you for all this information. Um, I was wondering for the 45V um, hydrogen production tax credit, you mentioned that there it has more strict requirements for disclosing CO2 emissions. Is there any sort of requirement for um, verification through a third party or any kind of um, verification of achieving those carbon emissions below the threshold? It's a really great question. Um, and the answer is that uh, it kind of depends on what you mean. Um, the proposal in the, the proposal that the Treasury Department put out at the end of December didn't really have that kind of detail for the gas side, in part because the gas attribute tracking systems do not really do a very good job with this stuff. Um, there are uh, clean energy, uh, clean electricity attribute tracking systems that are a little bit more robustly developed. Many of them involve third-party auditing, um, although only a very small number of them currently do hourly matching, which is the direction of travel the Treasury proposal proposed. So it's gonna take uh, work, and, and I would argue it's a good incentive. The surest way not to get hourly tracking is not to require it, and the surest way to get it is to make it a condition of the most generous tax credit in history. So some of those systems are gonna need to get built they do involve some third-party verification today. Um, I could go on and on. One of the challenges, I do a lot of work in carbon offsets where things are, I'll just say very bad if you're at all depressed about anything I've said here, let me tell you about carbon offsets. Um, third-party verification is a real problem in that world because offsets are based on counterfactuals. What I do relative to say what I would have done if I didn't get paid, you can't verify that, that never happens. So that's gonna be a challenge for some of the methane attribute offsetting systems that might be proposed if, if that direction is taken. I'm hopeful that on the electricity attribute side, we have pretty good data about what electricity generators do. And I'm hopeful that could be done robustly. I don't wanna comment on whether it is being done robustly because every system I've ever looked to into great detail has problems, but that's a tractable set of problems. And I'm optimistic that could be done well without knowing whether or not it is right now. Okay, any other question? Uh, hi, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a question because there's a lot of discussion in the space around like large utilities or even in uh, producers and deregulated, deregulated markets. Um, but I feel like there's not that much discussion. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about all of the rural electric co-ops throughout the country that serve a huge amount of 
um, of the country and and of electricity consumers. Uh, and just based on my work experience, it's like I see even within large utilities a sort of adoption lag or differences in their ability to digest new technical innovations between well-resourced orgs like an Excel or an Exelon versus like a Portland General Electric or a Tucson Electric Power that's just not as big. And so then when you scale that down even further to something like a rural electric co-op, I wonder sort of like what the ability and and uh, and resources there are for those sorts of organizations to pursue, um, you know, newer technologies that can get them further down the decarbonization path? Boy, that is a really good question. Um, I, I wish I could wave a magic wand and like tell you something easy, but the capacity constraints and interests of different groups are, it's a real barrier. One of the advantages to a number of the tax credits in the Inflation Reduction Act is there what's called direct pay. So it used to be to get the old tax credits for say renewable energy. You had to go through somebody who had tax equity, who had taxable equity appetite, and it involved working with large banks who would take big cuts. The policies have made these subsidies much more accessible to a wider variety of public and private actors, which will help reduce some of the challenges. But at the end of the day, exactly as you say, you know, the, the capacity of a utility and its ability to navigate the challenges it faces is a key barrier in their appetite for uptake of new ideas. And I will not pretend that I know how to solve that problem other than to reinforce there is widely different levels of sophistication in the utility industry. And back to the earlier question, the challenges and barriers of the organization of the utility industry are just critical determinants here. And this is one where I'm, I'm like sympathetic to the smaller co-op shops. They you know, don't always do the right thing on the environment, but I also appreciate some of their history and operations and, and, and why they are the way they are. So um, I'm hopeful that some of the tax credit approaches will make it easier for them to work with some of the options that are out there, but that doesn't necessarily make them interested or want to do it. And that's a separate set of problems for folks to be focused on. Okay. Here. Yeah. Um, I had a question more about carbon offsets. I think I'd seen a video of yours where you talked about your book and you'd compared carbon offsets to fraud or something like that. Yeah. I was kind of curious if you could talk a little more about that. <laughs> My favorite question. So uh, I think if you say one thing and do another, that that's fraud. Um, and what we're seeing in a lot of carbon offset projects that are out there is that the rules in those systems are so lax. They allow people to say things that are totally untrue and use that as a basis. I'll give you an example of, from the California carbon market, which has a very large forest offsets project. My favorite, most egregious example of this um, there is a, a particular forest project. It's run by an industrial timberland owner. A CEO of this timber company um, came out and said, look, I, I think there are problems with the protocol. I think there are problems with the rules. I am allowed to claim a carbon offset credit, which is treated as an additional reduction in emissions compared to what would have happened without my intervention. And somebody else is allowed to buy that credit and say, it's okay, I put CO2 up in the air because I paid this other guy not to put CO2 in the air. He said, well, this particular piece of land I have is subject to a conservation easement that says I cannot harvest the trees on the land. Nevertheless, for the purposes of saying what the baseline scenario is and the paperwork for earning a carbon offset credit, the rules specifically allow him to say he would cut down the trees, he is legally prohibited from cutting down, and earn credit for not cutting down those trees. That is, I'm going to use the word bullshit. It's also I want to be very careful. Fraud is a very specific legal accusation you would say about somebody in a certain context. What is interesting about this particular fact pattern is he followed the rules. His company followed the rules. The rules allow for an outcome that makes absolutely no sense. Let me give you one more example. I was just uh, on a radio piece yesterday about a tropical forest offset project in Cambodia. Many of these tropical forest offset projects have been criticized for claiming to do more than they actually do. This one was interesting because it had earned a special sticker from the carbon credit registry saying it was extra good for the local communities and extra good for biodiversity. One of the requisite attributes of that sticker was that there was is what's called free prior and informed consent, which is a concept in human rights issues. Generally, the idea is if you're going to come into a place, the local community has to authentically engage and give their consent for the activity before you begin the activity. It is unequivocal and undisputed in this particular case that the project activity started 31 months before 
the first free prior and informed consent meeting. Now, that is not prior informed consent. That is ex post something or other, probably box checking. And what's fascinating about this example is the verifying entity, the person who signed off and said everything looks in order, says in their documents that were released as part of a large report, we can't find the staff who were originally involved in this and our records are incomplete. Nevertheless, we are confident we followed the rules of this program. Meanwhile, the entity that runs this program says, we're opening an investigation into you. It's this classic situation. You all know the Spider-Man meme where like all the Spider-Man people are pointing at one another, right? It's, it's that. And something is clearly wrong if a project was certified as having free prior and informed consent when it was not. And I don't particularly care which of those parties screwed up to say that it's really screwed up. And if somebody knew or should have known that that was happening, arguably a situation like that is fraud. Okay, so we're getting to the end. Yeah. Thank you, Danny, for all these insights. And let's give a round of applause. To Danny. And thank you for joining us. Remember that we still have many exciting events going on this week. So please check out our website uh, and register at the energyweek.upen.edu. And last but not least, please join us for refreshments downstairs in the lobby. So thank you. <laughs>